Hello, friends, and welcome to the Optimized Advisor Podcast, where we focus on optimizing the well being and best practices of insurance and financial professionals today. On this show, our objective is to help you optimize your life, optimize your profession, and learn from other optimized advisors. I'm your host, Scott Heinela. We hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the Optimized Advisor Podcast. We appreciate you coming in today. Paul Garofoli with The Standard. Hey, thank you, Scott. This is an honor to be here. I'm a, I'm a listener and I love what your content is and the variety of topics that you have. And it's kind of surreal to be a guest. I appreciate that. We, we do appreciate all of our guests and we appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to have a little chit chat with us today. Uh, what are we going to chit chat about today? We're going to talk about annuities. Nice. So today's topic is all about Paul Garofoli, yes. uh, who was just brought into the annuity business yesterday. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. A lot of people call me a legend, and I've come <laughs> to learn that that means I'm just freaking old. Right, right. So <laughs> it, it works out, but it works out. I'll, ta- I'll, cl- I'll claim legend as opposed to old, but pleased to say that it's my 41st year in the business, and most of that was involved in the distribution of insurance products and really the last 20 years has been exclusively focused on on annuities. I dabbled in annuities before that, but hardcore annuities for the past 20 years. Okay, so let's, before we, what we want to talk about, and we were unpacking this a little bit, but what we're going to dive into is, you know, where where we've been right. from an annuity perspective. Uh, I would love to hear some insights and stories, share a little bit of that kind of walk down memory lane, if you will, of, of annuities. And then we can talk about where we are from an annuity perspective today and maybe some insights or some some uh, visions, some projections, if you will, of kind of where, where we're going from an industry perspective. Uh, so be, before we do that, why don't you talk a little bit about your career, the 40 years? What did you do for the first two decades in insurance? So I was still in distribution for the most part, but different product sets. So I came into the business in 1982 right out of college and started as an underwriter for the Paul Revere Insurance Company. Okay. So I quickly learned that I did not want to be a lifetime underwriter. And so I moved to sales very, very quickly. And there's a little bit of a backstory on that because during college- You can't be bottled up. (laughs) No, I can't. No. But what's interesting is people look look at me and, you know, why'd you do that and go from that kind of, you know, kind of like a career path in underwriting to sales? And- in college, I actually sold books door to door. And mm-hmm. I knew that based on my <laughs> on my major, which was political science, which I think might be the best preparation for the insurance business. But I knew that that might be a handicap looking to get to work. So I said, well, you know, I took this job selling books door to door. And uh, it was door knocking, cold calling. And so what I came to appreciate is that that is the fundamentals of sales and there's nothing harder and if you master that or just get average at it and i was average at it Mm -hmm. but i came to learn that if you are consistent then you can be successful the consistency leads to success and so from did you enjoy it um i you know i did i did what Mm -hmm. was interesting was i was based in massachusetts i'm a massachusetts native and the nature of the company was that they would transport people from Massachusetts, and I sold books in Texas. It was my first exposure to the great state of Texas where I now live, Mm -hmm. and uh, went door to door. Started in Waco, and then was in Oak Cliff, which is South Dallas, you know the area, and then uh, ended up in North Dallas, was kind of the, you know, the epitome of that summer of 79. But, you know, I, you know, it was hard, obviously was hard. Mm -hmm. But also from that, in terms of Retail sales, or in particular, what we do, wholesale sales and work with advisors and, and help them uh, be successful with their clients. It's like, this is easy. I mean, mm. you know, rejection, <laughs> it's, 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 I don't take it personal. It's really just a means to getting to an end. I think the big thing that I learned is that, you know. Did you th- ever take it personal even early on? Did you struggle with it uh, in the beginning or did you just more the proverbial water off the duck's back? Yeah. You know, obviously. Th- you have to handle rejection in our profession at whatever level you are, whether it's wholesaling, whether it's manufacturing product or dealing with the public directly. But what I came to learn is that 
the laws of averages, the predictability. I mean, I could still mm -hmm. tell you what they said, which was, you know, uh, 30 uh, encounters, 30 encounters with somebody, knock on the door, knock on enough doors that you see 30 people mm -hmm. opening the door. Then tell them your quick story, do 10 demos of what these books, these student handbooks, the Webster student handbook series can do, and that will lead to three sales a day. And they had years and years, decades and decades of statistics. And, you know, by golly, if they looked at it, it's like, if I get to talk to 30 people, just introduce myself, tell them what I'm doing, get into the house, do 10 demos a day, that will lead to three sales. And, wow. it's, and, and, and you know, it's interesting, and you're a student of the science of, of selling and marketing, you know, those numbers are still the same. They however, absolutely, they, <laughs> however, they ring true to they them, do, 100%. You know, they do. And of course, then, you know, the more proficient you get, the, the more targeted your audience is, the more you know about the people you're dealing with, and you can in, even improve those odds. But even just kind of going in cold, then you're able to do that. So, you know, moving forward from that, when I saw the mm. opportunity to go into wholesaling, and at that point, you know, we had talked about the background in the past 20 years with annuities. What did I do in the first 20 years? Well, that was kind of split between group insurance, which is what I did for the first 10 or so years. And then the next 10 years was focused on life insurance. Uh, and then the past 20 years, uh, almost exclusively on annuity. So, but always financial products. And what I found is that I really enjoy working with distributors. I love working with agents. I love training. Uh, and it's a different kind of selling. And I would advise the audience, particularly since you're advisor centric in your in your audience here on the podcast is that, you know, the people that do what I do, the carrier people, the company people, the people that carry the bag, it's almost a cliche, you know, they're great resources. Mm -hmm. And I don't think uh, that a lot of times advisors take advantage of that expertise or support or troubleshooting. I think that's a, uh, something that's overlooked. And I think it's a, it would be an advantage if people understood that, People like me are salespeople, mm -hmm. and you know nothing. Nothing happens until something gets sold. And as people understand, it's like I want to help people. I want them to be successful. I'm proud of what I do. I'm good at what I do, and uh, take advantage of it. Yeah, that's great. So, um, in the 20 years that you've been uh, akin to annuities, let's go back to the first annuity you right. ever quote unquote sold. Right. What were the days like then? Oh my gosh. It, it, it's a whole different world. It's a whole different Isn't it? world. It's oh. crazy. I can remember when I came into the business, the very first annuity application I ever put hands on. So it was in the brochure and it was not even a, not even a half a, not even a full half piece of paper. It was, it was perforated <laughs> as part of the brochure yeah. and it just tore off oh my where gosh. you put, you know, owner, annuitant, beneficiary, um, they signed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously they're pertinent information, right? But that was it, that a check or a transfer form. And that yeah. was the extent of the paperwork. Yeah. Yeah. The paperwork's gotten longer and the durations of the product have gotten shorter. And I will even outdate you there. Cause I still remember three part forms three-part forms and carbon copies and things like that. So it is pretty amazing. But, you know, the evolution of the products, you know, it, they, the paperwork, the complexity uh, is getting longer, mm -hmm. um, more involved. But on the other hand, the products are increasingly consumer-friendly, consumer-centric. And so there is that evolution. Mm. Uh, talk about duration. You know, it was not uncommon 20, 25 years ago to have a product 15, 20 years. Didn't think twice about it. Right. Uh, commissions were off the charts as Double well. Double digits. Double digits. I remember I, we, I went to one meeting and uh, at the company I was working with at the time, the commission went from 20% to 17%. Oh my gosh. And remember, and then we had an agent get up and he goes, hey, when are we going to get back to those 20% commissions? And it's like, hey, bud, the trend is going in the opposite way. And of course, if you look back then and said, well, commissions will be well, you know, average 5% as they do now, uh, sometimes a couple basis points more, a couple basis points less, you, you go, how can that possibly be? But the consumer value has increased geometrically. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the exciting part, the range of benefits 
And the, the things that the products can do today are, are so good. You know, going back to the olden days, the uh, two-tier annuities, mm-hmm. you know, that basically had a income value or annuitization value and then a surrender value. And, of course, again, those products would go out 15, 20 years, 20% surrender charges, all those things. Which would require the the account to be annuitized Correct. for some period of time, whether that's to the living annuitant, right. surviving spouse, or to the beneficiaries. Right. But there was always a tail yeah. of distribution. Yeah. Right. And so the, you know, the, the, it basically kind of anchored the client. If you wanted to realize the full potential of the annuity, you would have to annuitize, and not only annuitize for 10 years, annuitize for a lifetime mm-hmm. to actually realize that value going out. So, you know, the evolution, yeah, complexity, yes. Paperwork, more. Um, uh, range of options, almost infinite now, mm-hmm. but all lending themselves to a really compelling consumer value proposition that I think actually makes it easier to present uh, for the informed advisor. So back 20 years ago, were most of your customers uh, predominantly insurance-only agents, non-securities advisors? Yes. Yeah. The answer. Okay. Oh, the answer is yes to that. Yeah. But, you know the uh, because of the, the those durations of the products and the nature of it, the commissions even uh, that lent itself. So back in the day, um, working in the financial institution space, the broker dealer space, the bank space, that was. Certainly not anything that I was involved in then. Now, that evolution has uh, progressed, and, and the company I work for now is heavily entrenched in that space. But back then, it, you know, it was almost uh, you know, kind of bandits, renegades a little mm-hmm. bit in terms of, hey, this is this unique product, in particular with the introduction of the fixed index annuity. Back then, it was the equity index annuity because right. we had that uh, and wanted to give that aura of that you're getting kind of engaged in equities, but in a safe and certain way. Mm -hmm. So um, that took a certain mindset. And that was particularly those products in particular were, uh, were catered to the non registered insurance only producer. Now, the evolution now we see a lot of informed advisors that have multiple licensures that will put those as a alternative asset in their client investment mix. Do you think the the evolution of the distribution force, so in this case, the licensed insurance agent to the, the, the advisor now predominantly in some capacity is due to commit reduction of commission? Uh, and I know this would be just the, your professional opinion. Uh, or attributed to regulation, the sophistication of the products, the the kind of evolution of the products, or it, what, is it more because of the evolution or reduction of commission that has forced the distribution to shift? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. So, and obviously, people are very <laughs> successful at selling these products, and insurance only people are, do a great job. I was just at a meeting. Uh, today, as a matter of fact, with hundreds of insurance-only focused people that embrace annuities, so you can still be successful. But it's that combination of things, the different regulations, particularly at the the state level, primarily National Association of Insurance Commissioners, that uh, over the years, because of some excesses, you know, 20 and 25-year annuities, uh, we can argue the merits, and I always argue the longer, sometimes the better, because the insurance company can put more benefits in there, but at the same time, that presents some constraints on the consumer. I I can appreciate that. And so that reduction in duration, the introduction of non-forfeiture laws and minimum guaranteed surrender periods, now basically uh, it's very hard to find a product that's longer than 10 years. They still exist. Uh, So, you know, back in the day, 10 years was short. Right. Now 10 years... Long, is long is long so so we've seen that and and then consequently with that duration you have to adjust the commissions all the components of product design it all comes into play but that also lent itself to more adoption and acceptability of those products in other distribution channels particularly in the bank and broker dealer channel the bank in particular where there's a little more conservative and uh so that you know it's almost 
it's almost kind of reverse psychology. A high commission, even if the product is, is quality, is not looked upon very favorably in that channel. So right. it's, a, it's a delicate balance. So then you've seen that. So they kind of went hand in hand. Shorter duration uh, went to lower commissions, but more opportunity and more consumer value proposition. People are doing very well uh, in our sector of the financial services world. So you still do that. Uh, and can be successful. Mm-hmm. So let's talk a little bit about the products of today. Yeah, uh, we've 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 touched on a few of the items. One, shorter in duration. Uh, we've seen a little bit of movement in interest rates here in a short period of time. Oh my gosh! We could talk a little bit about that. We can also talk about this. I would I would really say not not necessarily the introduction because we're I think we're well beyond that. But now the evolution of right. volatility controlled indices. So let's take a one at a time. Um, what was the first one that I talked about? This is a quiz. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll the, take the last one, and we can go with that. The volatility the control. Volatility no, let, let, let's talk about shorter durations. Yeah. So the evolution of shorter duration products, uh, and then in the interest rate environment that we find ourselves in. Yeah. So you, you know, there those things kind of complemented each each other as well, and in particular the interest rate environment, because the evolution in particular. When drove talk, the yeah. reduction of surrender charge. Correct. Yeah. And then also the interest rate environment also was the the inspiration out of necessity for the creation of a fixed indexed annuity. Mm-hmm. You know, cuz back in the day when they were introduced, you know, depending upon which historian you go to in the business, but 95, 97 of that fixed index annuity interest rates were relatively low um, and there were try- were trying to find a way to make the yield competitive. And so the creation of that fixed index annuity also giving the opportunity for insurance only people to to give something attractive to their consumers but still be in that wrapper of a fixed annuity. So that was the that compelled the introduction of the fixed index annuity and then mm-hmm. back then, you know, the gold standard of indexing was the S&P 500. That's right. And whether and and the measurement of that was typically by way of a cap rate or a participation rate and that you know mo- many products only had one of those strategies s p 500 and then uh either have a cap or par and if you were really exotic you might have both both right yeah which i've never been a big fan of multiple moving parts but right right it's rare that you see those today correct and, yeah. but you know over time the investment marketplace the financial marketplace the interest rate environment so then we saw you know, interest rates gradually, gradually go, you know, I, I, I was kind of laughing, you know, remember at the, at the dawn of COVID, we were all concerned about negative interest rates. <clears throat> that was, that was three years ago. Yeah. We were all concerned about long-term negative interest rates. Right. Anybody were, you know, anybody taking, uh, you know, paying 2% to put their money in a savings account now? No. So it, it, th- that, that rise in interest rates because of a variety of factors uh, has lent itself to the additional things. And one of the things that we had in that low interest rate environment was the introduction of volatility controlled indexes. They, you know, they were, uh, you know, served a purpose and continue to serve a purpose, but it was a means of providing stability in option pricing. And I, we can go, you know, we can go down this rabbit hole in terms of product design, but, you know, the introduction of those volatility controlled indexes was to provide consistency and predictability in terms of the components, the measuring components, cap, par, high water mark, low water mark, whatever the measurement is that you could do that. And now from that, it's kind of sprung in an industry of its own. And, you know, you went from just the S&P 500 pure, mm-hmm. as I call mm-hmm. it, cap or par, now to hundreds and hundreds of different indexes with varieties of volatility controls. The benefit of that is that you get a little more consistency. You don't get those dramatic jerks in renewal rates. In fact, at my company, we've been able to harness that and actually guarantee the participation rates over time. And so, which is huge. It is huge, and that you know, we talked about like, well, where we're going. This so that's kind of the evolution of the interest rates. The rise of interest rates has given uh, a lot more ability to create uh, features that clients can appreciate and advisors can sell. So I think that's been a great, great 
yeah. enhancement. And, and that's one of the features where it look if I if I have a history of annuities, I yeah. understand the fact that rates can change on renewal, whether right. that's one, two, three year, whatever the reset period is. Right? That's that's a mechanism yeah. of the options pricing and the pricing of the product that the carrier should have ability to make those adjustments, and they do. Uh, but placing though it, it conversely. For those who don't have an experience or a history of annuities and they're new to the game as they're coming on board every day, uh, financial advisors, wealth managers predominantly, that's one of the sour surprises. Oh, yes. No doubt. Like, oh, wait, you mean that the rate can actually change? Yes. And so we, we, we proactively share that story and try and get ahead of that. You don't always uh, deliver in that. But to, to the point of having a product solution that is a guaranteed rate is a major enhancement to the industry at large. Yeah, and that's the evolution. And we talked about in the pre-show about you know where are we going and those things I, I'm really excited about because they're introducing more features. Now, the Achilles heel has always been the renewal issue. And obviously, advisors with experience recognize there's companies that have reputations for renewal integrity and there's some companies that are using the opportunity that they can adjust those factors to improve their profitability over time so you know there's there's ways to evaluate carriers but you can avoid the drama if you go with carriers that have either a really good renewal history and and people with expertise like you can help guide advisors to those companies or ones that actually contractually guarantee the terms of the contract over time. So that makes it, I think that makes it simpler. And I'll add to that one more bullet point of shorter in duration, continuing to promote and for the consumer, right. albeit uh, rate consideration, shorter duration does create the liquidity opportunity to go then find the optimal solution right. for the client yeah. once that contract matures. So yeah. that does eliminate some of that renewal exposure if you're a renewal rate risk. Right, right. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the beauty of that. And, and we see a lot of popularity of, of five and seven year durations. Mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, we talked about the evolution there and that's, you know, and that's now typical average duration of a uh, fixed index annuity in particular is between five and seven years, as you know. Uh, now, the, uh, the, you know, the double-edged sword of all this choice and all this consumer centrism is that there can be confusion mm -hmm. because now you have how many indexes can you choose uh. from and what providers and what customized indexes or proprietary product and you know all that and I think sometimes we get so focused on all the features kind of almost the minutia of these products we forget the core value which is protecting people's money allowing it to grow predictably and then allowing them the opportunity to take advantage of that money and either move it to another opportunity or to take and use it as a, a, a source of income to supplement their retirement. So the, you know, the purpose of the products are still pure. And sometimes we get a you know, little caught up in, well, this index, that index, I heard about this, it does these kinds of things. And I think, we, we need to focus on the central value proposition of the product, which is tax deferral, guaranteed uh, return of your money, and a predictable growth. I think, mm -hmm. that's, the, I think that's the key. And, and, and serving as a supplemental alternative asset, uh, you know, we talk about diversification in terms of people's financial profile, and an annuity is a diversified asset. It is unique in and of itself. And that's the thing that I love about being an annuity advocate is that we provide value to consumers each and every day. Which I'll, I'll add to not just, well, to add to the benefits that you just described, uh, which we won't go into, but to enlighten the audience of the guaranteed income solutions that the products can provide that's aside from or separate from annuitization. Right. There's a whole world of opportunity that exists there from that standpoint. From a death benefit standpoint, a legacy play, you might be able to touch on something like that here in a moment. And of course, having some annuity solutions that are leveraged for long-term care benefits. So uh, depending on the annuity, the function, the need, the goals and objectives of the client's, 
there's almost like a Swiss Army knife solution that exists Absolutely. in the marketplace today. Absolutely. And there's where having that expertise becomes critically important. Yeah. I'd love to get your take on the, and then wrap up the kind of the volatility control strategy conversation. Um, your take and how you address, because naturally the response would be high, you know, in the low rate environment, the carriers were very smart or the, the, the creators of these strategies, were, I think were pretty smart in the sense that, well, we can't really effectively price these from a cap standpoint. So what are we going to do? We're going we're gonna to price these and have an uncapped or unlimited uh, upside, which is not necessarily true, uh, but we're going to tie a, a participation rate. Right. And so uh, even advisors regularly cast this assumption higher participation rate equals better strategy. And to me, that's not, that's not true, not entirely false, right, right. but there is definitely more to unpack and more to meet than meets the eye. Yeah, sometimes 50% of one thing is more than 200% of another thing. Bingo. That's the key is that. Well, and it's know, a, how can that be? Right, and so it's well, what are you measuring? You know, and I, I always kind of go with, are you measuring in inches or centimeters? You know, it's still the same measurement, but it's like, look how many more centimeters than I <laughs> that I get out of a foot. That's I a get, great, great analogy. You know, it, it, but it's still the same. Simple, and everybody gets measurement. Right, right. So it's just a, it's a way of measuring it, and you know, there's a little bit of marketing art to the design of products, and that was something that we we would endorse, which is, hey, you can participate, and there's no cap, and the and the, the secret, not such a big secret, but we all understand that the limitations are already built into the index itself. And that's really the distinction between be, uh, using a, an S&P 500, for example, uh, and an S&P 500 vol control, because mm -hmm. there's some modification within that index that um, can be good mm -hmm. and sometimes can bring in other uh, investment options within that index, a blended index, hybrid index, we use those terms as well. Mm -hmm. But also, it, it is a limiting factor. So you you may get more of less. Right. And if that more is enough to be the equivalent of getting less of something more, then it works, it still works out. Yeah. The key, the key to remember, and I think this is lost sometimes, is that all we're trying to do with all these different ways of determining interest is we're trying to do better than what you would earn in a fixed account. Bingo. So back in the day, if you would, could earn 3% in the bank or 3% in a fixed rate annuity, if you could get four or five over time, over a period of time, seven to 10 years, then you won. That's mm -hmm. the key. Not 10, not trying to keep pace with the market. Uh, now in the environment where, you know, the stakes are a little bit higher. You know, you can get five. You know, the gold standard for a five-year multi-year guaranteed annuity is that 5% rate. Yeah. And we see people in and around We haven't that. seen these rates It's, it, I mean, 12, 14 years. I tell people it's time to make hay because <laughs> the sun is shining. It Scott. really is. So, but now, so now. It is about freaking time. Yes, yes. And do it now. Do it now. I mean, this is the this is the renaissance age of annuities right now. That's right. But it does go back to, I'll close on, the, on the, this topic on this, is like, it does go back to the fact that why are we buying these even to begin with? And it's because of the inherent benefits that they provide a portfolio right. in totality. Uh, the rate is relative to the environment that we're operating in. Just so happens to be right now, we have a great story that we've been telling for the last 20 plus years to go with sexy rates. Right, right. That's it. That's yeah. it. And, you know, I, I used to deal with the you know, uh, an advisor and go, look, we got tax deferral, we got protection from creditors, we got uh, passes probate without having to reveal your finances, and you want a rate of return too. all the elements of the product <laughs> in and of itself, if, if you never earned anything, you could still even justify that it may, might make sense as a part of somebody's financial, uh, financial profile. That's right. But now we have the opportunity to earn competitive rates. But you know, again, that standard is we're trying to just give her the opportunity with the fixed index annuity, the opportunity to do slightly better, usually one to 2% consistently over time, right? Uh, over in a fixed rate. And 
And yeah, that's you, what we've always said. 100 to 200 basis points greater right. than whatever fixed instrument you can find, right. and that's the objective. And again, you know, you can, uh, as an advisor listening to this podcast, you can do yourself a service and your clients a service by setting expectations properly. Mm-hmm. If you have the right expectations and convey those to the to the client, then it's it's golden times going forward. Okay, now let's shift gears yeah. and say, where are we going? Well, where you know, I think there's a couple different ways. You know, the, in terms of the evolution of fixed index annuities, we'll talk about that. You know, some of these enhancements that I think are going to be coming up can apply to some fixed rate annuities. But basically, you know, the first part of the fixed index annuity life cycle was accumulation. That was a story. Doing better, offering a better rate of return than a traditional fixed rate instrument, whether it be a money market. Uh, savings accounts, savings bonds, things like that. So mm-hmm. accumulation focus, that was the way to go. And then in the mid-2000s, we went with the income story. Mm-hmm. And you know this from your own career, you know, the, uh, stampede of, of products with income riders. Mm-hmm. And now that's kind of coming back a little bit. So, But we had that. So accumulation, then we went with income. And now what I see is ancillary benefits. And I see two things developing and there are good carriers in the marketplace with some of these benefits to a certain degree. Uh, One of those is enhanced death benefits, Mm -hmm. you know, because the reality is that most people will die with their annuity, right? Either fully or partially intact. Mm -hmm. You know, very few people outlive their annuity. Right. So we, so we understand that. So, you know, in essence, an annuity has become a legacy benefit maybe not the most tax efficient, and we could do a whole podcast on life insurance, and I know you've done ta- tackled that topic here in this forum as well. So, But having a death benefit, recognizing that people are going to keep their annuity and they're considering it at some point in time to be a legacy benefit, so if you can enhance that in some way, provide a value uh, uh, similar to an income value, a payment base that's based on a death benefit that pays out. So we see that, and then I think what gets me excited are the opportunities for other liquidity, particularly relative to long-term care mm-hmm. benefits? Right, right. And so, you know, there that 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 evolution is happening. It are it, it's existed in some form. Most annuity products today have a have a, a long-term care admission rider where you get full liquidity uh, on the income mm-hmm. side. You get right, right, an right. income doubler, so you have that. So you have that. And then, you know, I think the next component is having leveraging and having a benefit and actually having more money for the event if in fact you need uh, care, nursing home care in particular, but then evolving even f- further with home health care and being based on their ability to do activities of daily living. So I think those things are in play. There are a few players, like I said, uh, a few in the death benefit arena and then very few in the leveraged long-term care benefits. And I think you'll find more and more people going there because it just makes sense. It's consumer centric and uh, people are looking for that from the product. So that's the evolution that I see there. Absolutely. I think if you boil that down, which you did a very uh, great job of articulating that it's like, what are the three main outcomes that we see of deferred annuities? Uh, And I would probably challenge in this order Legacy passing to beneficiaries, uh, income, planning specifically. So actually very intentionally positioning this for to and for the income generation need of the right. husband, wife, you know, spouse, a couple. And then third, and probably growing quickly, uh, is that risk and that need for long-term care planning that'll probably eclipse or get probably 2A, 2B yeah. in terms of income and LTC planning. And so, you know, uh, with that, continuing to see the evolution of how the insurance companies respond to that. And the other driver of that will be regulation, right? Yes. So maybe we can unpack this a little bit, but starting with, and I don't want to go down the rabbit hole right, of this, right. but like the, the, the states adopting uh, particular long-term care uh, taxes requirements for their citizens 
will will absolutely move the needle yeah. uh, in some capacity towards private pay, privately purchasing of whether it be a long-term care annuity, a long-term care solution in some capacity. But what other things are we seeing down the pike here or that we're dealing with presently from a regulatory standpoint? Yeah, I think the big thing that we're seeing is um, the continuing pressure from at the federal level in terms of regulating our business. And in particular, the, it's the reintroduction of the fiduciary standard mm-hmm. or an expanded fiduciary standard, fiduciary standard 3.0, um, from the Department of Labor trying to reach into not only 401k rollovers, but also IRAs in the form of annuities. And I think, you know, a lot of agents that I deal with, well, you know, the insurance carriers will take care of it. We don't have to worry about it. You need to worry about it mm-hmm. because if you actually read the proposed regulations, it makes it very difficult for an insurance only advisor. If you're, operating within the letter of the regulation to provide advice, to assist even in repurposing uh, qualified money, particularly in 401ks or the thrift savings plans into annuities, even if it's the best thing that somebody would want to do. And many people want to do that. It's very difficult to do that. It's an overreach uh, from the Department of Labor. You know, we've, we've had dealt this issue. We've got some favorable, uh, ruling from the Fifth Circuit on the previous version, but they went back to the well and they're trying again. There's a lawsuit going on that I actually watched because it was based here in Dallas and watched the oral arguments. And you know, and again, it, it, it comes from a sense, and this is the thing to think about from an advisor standpoint, why, you know, why are we, is the government so concerned about it? Mm-hmm. They're concerned about people's ability to plan for their retirement. Now, the conclusions and what they're trying to do, I think, are faulty. But nonetheless, it comes from that motivation, which is there is a retirement crisis in the in, in America. Oh. You know, we have ten thousand people retiring every day. We have um, Social Security. You know, Social Security is compromised. We ha- also uh, many more people say that they don't have enough for retirement. The average retirement savings. For a person approaching retirement is fifty thousand mm-hmm. dollars, you know. So we have all these things, and so they're trying to find ways to, uh, you know, in essence, discourage people f- from moving out of their four hundred one k. I don't think so. You know, I, I'll give them credit. Some people have think there's more malevolent um, motivations behind there, but I think I think the motivation is is pure. It's the execution that's poor, and making it more difficult for people to customize their retirement by way of a fixed annuity or fixed index annuity with all these benefits that we talked about, more benefits coming and enhancements, I think is a disservice to the consumer. And there's people standing up and, and fighting against that. And I, th- I think the outcome will be good, but you have to be prepared. Regulations are changing. I also saw, and I, I don't want to be an alarmist, but you know, there's a model NAIC, we call it expanded suitability, and about 33 states have adopted that. California is looking to make it even more stringent and make it more difficult. And you know, and again, I I assume that the bureaucrats are are their motivation is 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 somewhat pure. But it may, the more difficult you make things for good natured, uh, purposeful advisors to help the average consumer. They're not going to get the help that they need, and right. so it's counterproductive. That's what annoys me about it so much, is that it's counterproductive to have more regulation. You know, we've seen this evolution just in a rel- you know, in my lifespan, shorter duration, more consumer value, uh, great potential returns, all the features that annuities, the wrapper in and of itself does, and and we need to make it easier for people mm-hmm, to mm-hmm. buy annuities, and that's. That's the amazing contradiction. It's kind of the dichotomy because we see some regulations, the Secure Act and the Secure Act 2.0, that make it uh, more favorable towards annuities. And then we see other regulations that make it more difficult for them to be bought and sold. It's crazy. Yeah. You know, you make a good point too, I'll add to, to just the adoption rate by both industry at large, financial institutions, independent broker dealers, wirehouses, banks, credit unions, the like, all thereof 
who've over the years continued to onboard these products and solutions, but also the manu product manufacturers. I mean, there's a significantly increased uh, supply of manufacturers of these products, not just the chassis themselves, but the creators and the manufacturers of the strategies that are lying on these products. And all, my point in all of that is, what does that do? Drives competition. Dri competition drives what? Consumer value. Right. So the capitalistic yes. markets, the market at large, is taking care of what I would argue these concerns of the regulators, not in per not not perfect in any way, but certainly in a in a very very large part. Not to mention the state regulations, which uh, do vary. Many states follow the same or very similar guidelines, but there's always those handful of outliers that yeah. say, you know, we're, we're not going to play in their sandbox or anyone else's sandbox. We're going to play in our own sandbox. Right, right. And that's the way it goes. And, uh, um, you know, that's the nature of it. But you know, like you say, uh, competition spurs innovation. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and we're seeing that. We've seen that evolve pretty dramatically even in the last five years, certainly 10. I yes. Mean, oh, my gosh. Incredibly so. Yeah. It's like, oh, wait a minute. Where do those guys come from? And all yeah. of a sudden, you know, they go they go from nothing to billions of dollars of sales. Hey, good for them. Good for the competition. Good for the advisor that has access to all these great products. Just makes us all better. So in closing, can you give us a quick commercial on what it is you're currently doing in your current capacity and how they might be able to get a hold of you? Well... You know, I'm known as the annuity king. I love working <laughs> for the standard. So when... Uh, do you remember Bob Williams? I, I do. I okay. do. Yes. 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 Also I the proclaim, pro proclaimed, excuse me. Yes. Now, you rightfully can take over that throne because right. he is since, uh, since many retired. years retired. Yeah. That's yeah. right. So it's kind of like Game of Thrones. So, you know, I... <laughs> I took over King's Landing. The West Land and the East. Yeah, I took over King's Landing. I brought my dragon, Whoa. and now I'm king of annuities. But no, I work for the Standard. Uh, and um, Great company, yeah, by the way. Yeah, Good I, product. And I say, you know, why settle for the average when you can get the Standard? So we do a great job on fixed rate and fixed index annuities. I work with advisors and distributors all across the country. Uh, do Love to do training. If you want to get a hold of me, I'm pretty easy to find. It's Paul Garofoli, G-A-R-O-F-O-L-I. I get the first page on Google because there's not too many Paul Garofolis mm -hmm. doing anything. Um, anything and the standards anything. website for the annuities? The standard is standard.com backslash annuities, standard.com backslash annuities. And Scott, as you know, our website is pin and password free, so you can get rates, you can get forms, you can get illustrations without having to go through a whole you know, uh, authorization process. So it's right there, very advisor friendly and would welcome the opportunity to work with your listeners. In and of itself, that is refreshing as well, to have access to pertinent information without it being behind some firewall, you know. Uh, uh, you know it, it, and it, it, there's wonderful sales literature, the educational and sales literature that is also on the standards website. So I encourage everybody who's listening to go check it out. It is a great resource. Absolutely. And that's the thing. Yeah. You cited it, Scott, that we have a lot of uh, compliant consumer friendly pieces. You know, a lot of times we have all these great things and we hide behind the firewalls and the language and everything like that. And if uh, I just need something that promotes and helps people understand what an annuity does. And so we have non-denominational pieces that talk about the advantages of annuity, the cost of waiting, all kinds of things that I think could help an advisor position the products properly in their client's mix of, of financial service investments. Wonderful. Paul, thank you for coming in. We appreciate the time. Going down annuity memory lane. Yes. It's Nos been good. Nostalgia. Thank That's you, right. Scott. Cheers to you. Thanks for listening. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode. Please subscribe, like, share, leave a comment or review. Be sure to check us out on social media at Optimized Advisor Podcast. Till next time.